Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks to Harris. Thanks to all of you, of course, for coming, because it would be pretty lonely up here if you weren't out there. And thanks to my partner, Pauline, who's behind the camera over there, and who's been traveling with me. You can only imagine what that's like. I can't even imagine traveling with me. I'm such a bummer. I don't have to imagine. <laughs> so there's that. Anyway, you've been given a terminal diagnosis. You were given the terminal diagnosis at birth. We all know that birth is a sexually transmitted disease that is proven fatal in every case. And yet it, we act otherwise. We act as if we're going to live forever. And we act almost like everybody else around us. We go to school, we go to school some more, we get married, we have 2.5 children, we raise our children, we wait 40 years, and we retire. And then, then we think about how we're going to enjoy it the rest of our lives. It's absurd. Almost all of us act the same way, myself included, for a long time. Now that you've been given a terminal diagnosis and you've come to recognize it, the question emerges, how do we act? What if you, what if you only have 10 years? What if you only have five? What if you only have 10 months? What if you only have four months? What if you only have four weeks? Does your response change? How shall I live my life? What do you do in light of a terminal diagnosis? After all, as Homer pointed out some 2,600 years ago, any moment might be our last. Any moment might be our last. How do we live with that information? I suspect most people, in light of a terminal diagnosis, do not mope around. OK, maybe for the first little bit upon learning of their terminal diagnosis. Like, when I was 11, I was devastated. My grandmother died. It was the first person relatively close to me who died. And I cried for weeks. And then much later, probably 10 years later, it took me to figure out that I wasn't really crying for her. I barely knew her. We would visit her once a year. It was a long way away. I barely knew this woman, but I cried at the age of 11 because her death reminded me that I have to die too. And so I was coming to grips with my own mortality. So when I got the terminal diagnosis, I cried for a little while. But then most of us move beyond that, we begin to live. And for most people who have been given a terminal diagnosis, who have been told that they have six weeks or eight weeks or eight months or eight years to live, it becomes about living. They begin to think about the things that they've always wanted to do. And they try to get them, them done. Hopefully, people have an, an opportunity to complete the relationships in their lives. The opportunity to say goodbye. The opportunity to tell somebody that you love them. That's the gift of a terminal diagnosis, is that it gives us an opportunity to complete those relationships which I suspect everybody in this room deems more important than accomplishments and material possessions. The relationships are what make our lives worth living. Living with a ter terminal diagnosis, I have, I have water, obviously varies for every person. Some people have a bucket list. Some people have had a, I used to have a bucket list. It was like this long. And over the course of the last 15 or 20 years since I first comprised my bucket list, my bucket list has grown not necessarily because I've completed everything off the list and checked it off, but rather because my bucket list has become longer than my bucket list. There's a whole bunch of things I just don't care about anymore. <laughs> I don't really need to float down the Grand Canyon. I just don't. That was on my bucket list for a long time. I don't need to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. I've done that a few times. That's why I got to cross that one off. But there's a bunch of things that I realize I don't need to do. They, they fall into the category of accomplishment rather than relationship. So they're not particularly fulfilling for me anymore. I love that some people in light of the terminal diagnosis began drinking wine as soon as they showed up. It's like a whole table full here. I guess you saw me coming. 
<laughs> and by the way, in light of our terminal diagnosis, regardless of how long we have left, and I suspect it's not very long, I have never proposed inaction. Rather, I have proposed what a Buddhist might call right action. I'm not Buddhist. I've been strongly influenced by Buddhist philosophy, if not Buddhist religion. Buddhists believe in something called right action, right thought, and a bunch of other right things. And taking right action, especially in light of a terminal diagnosis, is a pretty good measure of our character. In addition, another tenet of Buddhist philosophy is to not be attached to the outcome. So I have attempted to take right actions throughout my life, and almost every time I realize afterwards that it didn't turn out quite the way I planned. If I were attached to the outcome of my, ma my actions, I would be devastated by now. I would realize that I'm over about a million. And yet, what better judge of our character than how we act in the face of impossible odds? When there's no way we can make a difference in the world, and we take the right actions anyway. We act with compassion. We act with love. We pursue excellence even though it doesn't make a bit of difference to the world around us. <laughs> Some people, in fact, find my message liberating. This, this, this series of lines comes from Serena Raphael, 25 years old, in Western Australia. And Serena came home from university one day to find her housemate awash in emotions and blood because she knew that her university professors had been lying to her. She knew that her baby boom generation university professors were not telling her the truth. And what they were telling her and what almost every professor I know about today tells the millennials is, you need to fix it. Climate change is a major problem. You need to fix it. We're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. You need to fix it. We have fouled the air and dirtied the water and washed the soil into the ocean. We have gone far into human population overshoot. You need to fix it. How insane. It's not their mess. And so she points out older generations must stop dumping it on us. It wasn't our generation, it wasn't the millennials who created this series of disasters. We can't expect them to fix it. Small wonder Serena's friend was on the verge of suicide because she's been told her entire life, you need to fix it. And she knows it's unfixable. This is a predicament. It's not a problem. Solutions have problems. Math books have problems. You look in the back and there's the solution. Predicaments don't have solutions. We just live with them. We've all been given a predicament. We've been given a terminal diagnosis. I want to talk a little bit about my favorite subject. That would be me. Please bear with me. I had no idea. I was 36 years old and I had, I had ongoing surveillance. And I found out much later, in fact, June 24th of last year, about a year ago, I found out for the first time that I had been surveilled for the last 20-some years. That's how good they are, for one thing. <laughs> and it was, it was right out in the open. It was so obvious. It was that invisible receptionist who handled every piece of mail and every piece of correspondence and was a single mother and was always in dire financial straits who else could it have been? She was the contact on the inside. Of course she was. And then I had an NSA contractor spy in my classroom in 2005. No clue. If he were to walk in here today, I would not be able to pick him out of the lineup. He told me these things, he being Mark Austin, his cover. He told me these things a few days after he left service. 
as an NSA contracted spy. So he thought he was escaping. He moved to Costa Rica and tried to save some sea turtles. Well, then, apparently, around the election last fall, things got a little dicey for the federal government. So he, he, he was called back into service. Apparently, when you're an NSA contracted spy, you don't really have a choice about how long you, to, you get to retire in any event. And of course, I can't be too sure about any of this because he admits he's a spy. And what's the job of spies? To lie. So I don't know how much of this is true and how much of this is not true. I suspect, based on the heavily redacted reports I've seen, that he's the real deal and that he's at least providing some information because he tells me things about me that nobody knows except me. Which makes me a little sketchy already. He points out that the Jason group at the Pentagon, and these are the smartest people in the room, the Jason group in a, in a report to be published later this year finds that rather than going Venus, Earth will instead go Mars. Because of abrupt climate change leading to the catastrophic meltdown of the world's 440 some nuclear power facilities, that ionizing radiation is going to go up into the atmosphere, strip away the atmosphere. So unlike Venus, which has a very heavy atmosphere and keeps the temperature at about 462 degrees Celsius, we're going to more closely resemble Mars. And the date he listed was 2054. That's not long. Most climate scientists do malpractice. Most climate scientists won't tell you what I know even though they know what I know because they have something to protect. I have nothing to protect. I have no job. I haven't received a paycheck since, since walking away from an irredeemably corrupt system in 2009. So I'm not doing this for money. I'm not fleecing you, contrary to the rumors you read on the internet. I'm not manipulating you in any way. I'm trying to provide the information that I have at my disposal. And the information is constantly updated because Every day we read about a new report from the referee journal literature, the incredibly conservative referee journal literature, indicating the situation is far worse than it was yesterday, much less a year ago or 10 years ago. More about me. Did I mention that part? Yeah. January 2007, my department had just hired a new department head and I was filled with glee because this was a friend of mine. I was involved in the hiring process. During the interview, she, she looked me right in the eye and told me I will fall on my sword to protect your academic freedom. Because at this point, the university had already been trying to heavily censor me. And so this is a friend of mine, somebody I knew from a long way back. And one of the things we shared in common is that we love to teach. We're at a research one institution where almost all of the perks come because of good research. Your scholarship is really what matters because that's what brings in the money. We were both teachers, and so I was excited as I could be to have Lisa as my department head. And so when I came in to her office two or three days after she started her job as the new department head, we hugged on the way in the door. After all, we're longtime friends. And then we sit down, and she tells me, one of the few one of the few pieces of power I have as a department head is I get to decide which classes the faculty teach. And I have decided that you are no longer going to teach any classes in this department. Let me be clear about something. The reason I'm here in front of you today is because I'm a teacher. It's not what I do, it's who I am. When I was six years old, I dragged the Dick and Jane primer home to my four and a half year old sister, poor Carol, and I tried to teach her how to read. And I was so frustrated two weeks into my first grade experience that my four and a half year old sister didn't know the difference between spot and a dog and between puff and a cat that I was outraged. <laughs> Elvis, Elvis Costello in the song about the red shoes provides a good piece of advice on this one. I used to be disgusted, now I try to be amused. <laughs> Mostly at myself. 
I continued for another two years or so at the University of Arizona, but I couldn't do what I loved to do, which was to connect intimately with students over the course of an entire semester or, in many cases, over the course of an entire lifetime after that. Instead, I was teaching in a program called Poetry Inside Out. Inside was the men's pods of the Pima County Jail and the girls' pods of the Pima County Juvenile Detention Facility. Out was a Hispanic-dominated inner-city high school where most of the students had been kicked out of at least three other more conventional high schools, and that was their entrance card into their new school. And then the fourth leg of the program was my honors course, because once I could no longer teach in my home department, the honors college was happy to have me because I was pushing the cultural envelopes. And so I was teaching this program through the, through the honors college. I would take my honors students, all of them, essentially all of them, upper middle class Caucasian kids into juvie hall. And in juvie hall, there were 13 to 17 year old Latina girls and women and they were not upper, upper middle class. They were poor. They were parented by a single parent or a sister. They were taking care of their younger kids, their younger siblings. Some of them were parents. A third of them in the high school approximately were parents. Many of them were homeless. They'd been shot at. They'd been stabbed. They'd had a friend die in their arms. They'd been abused in every imaginable way, most recently sexually abused by their mother's current boyfriend. I'd ask them honor students when we came out of juvie hall after an hour and a half or two hours, I'd ask the, the upper middle class white kids, what was that like for you? And they would think for a minute there on the bench in the shade and they would say almost universally, they would say something like, they're just like me. They came to recognize that our similarities overwhelm our differences. So these wealthy white kids were seeing that these poor Hispanic kids, almost the same age, were just like them. They'd had different life experiences, mostly as a result of their color and the amount of money they had access to. And the students came to recognize this. And in fact, the girls in juvie hall, almost every week one of them would come up to me and whisper, I think I'm as smart as these honor students of yours. <laughs> and I couldn't argue with them there. <laughs> I think I should go to college. Do you think I could go to college? Yeah, I think you can go to college. These kids were learning empathy. I think it's the most important thing we can learn. I have no idea how to teach it. I think I was asked to not teach not because I was a poor teacher. In fact, I want, to, I want to distinguish here between teaching and learning. I think I was a really good teacher. I taught my dog to whistle. I taught and I taught and I taught. My dog never did learn to whistle. But I was a really good teacher, <laughs> I kept telling myself. That's the conservative approach. Ultimately, I realized that it's about the learning, it's not about the teaching, and the most important thing we can learn is empathy. By the time I had that meeting with my new department head, in my second year on campus at the University of Arizona, I was awarded the highest advising recognition given by my home college, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And five years before that meeting, I was acknowledged by the graduate college as one of two faculty per year to be recognized with their highest award. So this is one of the two transdisciplinary colleges at the University of Arizona. The other recognized me with their highest honor, faculty of the year, the year I left active service at the University of Arizona. So I think actually I was really quite good at teaching. I think my students were learning empathy. I used anarchism in my classrooms. It's not a bad thing. Chaos is the absence of rules. Anarchy is the absence of rulers, just to be clear. Anarchism means taking responsibility for yourself and for your neighbors, human and otherwise. 
So I was modeling anarchism in my classrooms, and as, as it turns out, the deep state didn't really appreciate that. Who knew? I didn't really think about it. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Thus, I was surveilled since 1996 and had that spy in my classrooms, I think because I was a radical. And this, this square root symbol, this is actually called a radical. It has a name. When I ask college students what it is, they tell me it's a square root symbol. That's its function. And what is it called? A radical. Why? Because it gets to the root. If you look up definition of radical, it doesn't mean extremist or terrorist or the guy that, that blew up the plane, tried to blow up the plane with his shoes. It doesn't say any of those things. Radicalism means getting to the root. And I've been getting to the root for a long time. That's why I attracted the attention of the government. You know, there are three Chinese curses. Most people know the one, the third most dire of the Chinese curses. May you live in interesting times. Most people know about that one. What's the second most dire of them? May you attract the attention of the government. <laughs> Shazam. <laughs> and number three, and the worst of them all, may you find what you're looking for. Be careful. As an indication of my early days as a radical, this is a snippet from my high school valedictorian address, delivered with as much hubris as any 18-year-old could possibly manage. Anyone can be a conformist, so I gave my classmates permission to be a nonconformist, if that's what it takes. I, look at, I, I only discovered this last November. I was going through my scrapbooks from when I was 18. What was I doing that for? It's kind of a strange thing anyway. And I discovered this line. I, I had no memory of this, of course. But, and it was in the newspaper article, so it must be true. <laughs> so I think I was radicalized from a fairly early age. In fact, it was in my early days of classroom teaching that I was pointing out the lies my culture told me, including the myth of human superiority. The title of Derek Jensen's latest book is The Myth of Human Supremacy, as if we're superior in some way. In fact, we don't ever say this out loud because people would laugh. Or if somebody comes up and says, humans are actually superior to all other animals, then you would just answer, OK, well, why don't you go live the rest of your life on the nuts from oak trees? Now, now, don't, now you don't seem so swift, do you? But what do we call So we don't say it out loud. We don't say humans are superior. In fact, we just assume it. We just assume that away. Of course we are. How do we assume it with our language? What do we call non-human animals? We call them lesser animals or lower animals. That doesn't sound so sweet, does it? We can have infant growth on a finite planet. Of course, nobody would say that out loud because you'd laugh in their face. We just assume it away. That's why we have a positive discount rate or a positive interest rate. That's why you continue to draw, albeit a minor amount, of income from the money you put in the bank because we assume infinite growth. It doesn't make any sense to assume infinite growth on a finite planet, but that's what we do. And so far, it's worked great. We've enjoyed a period of economic expansion since at least World War II that's unparalleled in human history. More is better, of course it is. Everybody says future generations will have access to more, and they mean more of everything, and they mean more is better no matter what the more is. We monetize everything. When I was on tour in New Zealand in November and December of last year, New Zealand air was going for 85 cents a breath in Beijing. I couldn't make this up. They were canning the air in 10 cans. Imagine how much that cost filling them with New Zealand air, transporting them to Beijing, and people were buying them for 85 cents a breath. Open the can, breathe. No. Have you been to Deje Beijing? The air is unbreathable. So there's, there's all kinds of tricks that people are playing them on themselves to make them breathe the air and pretend that the air is fine. But that's what civilization does. We foul the air, 
we dirty the water, we destroy the food, we poison the food, and then we monetize it and people pay for it. Sounds like quite a sweet gig, doesn't it? None of this happened before civilizations arose a few thousand years ago. The first 2.8 million years of the genus Homo, since Homo erectus on this planet, 2.8 million years, there was no monetizing the food. That only came about when we began to store grains, when we began to grow grains at scale and store grains. When did that happen? Well, interestingly enough, it happened when we came out of the last ice age, the global average temperature increased about one and a half degrees Celsius. That's it, about three degrees Fahrenheit. And then it stabilized, and it was stable for nearly 10, 10 11,000 years. And within a couple of thousand years, the first civilizations ever arose. A handful of places around the globe, suddenly people were growing grains at scale. And once you can grow grains, you can store the food and get through the hard times. It's no longer a hunter-gatherer day-to-day experience. Now we can store the food. And once you can store the food, you can control the people. And you can make a lot more people, too. And so multiple civilizations have come and gone because they went into human population overshoot, albeit at the local or regional level. Now we're there at the global level, way down that road. So what happens next will be most interesting. We're told to think positive. We actually say this one out loud. If you don't have hope, there's something wrong with you. You might be clinically depressed. <laughs> People ask me all the time if I'm depressed. No, but I am a carrier. Pain is mandatory. Suffering is optional. That's in your head. That's how you respond to what comes at you. I think hope is a horrible idea. I'm hope free. I gave up on it years ago. I have no hope, and I, I, have, I don't have any of the other side of the I don't know the future coin either, that other four-letter word, fear. Fear is projecting something into the future that you don't have any control over. Hope is projecting into the future something that you don't have any control over. They're the same thing. We hope something will work out. We fear it won't. But we don't assume control over any of that. It just happens to us. I'm hope free. I no longer wish for a future over which I have no agency. That's the definition of hope. Hope is wishful thinking. I live now. I live fully now, as fully as I can now. Because I think hoping for everything to turn out fine when we've crapped in our nest for several thousand years is probably not the wisest approach. I think that fearing a future that might indeed be dystopian is not a good approach either. Hope and fear. I don't have much room for either of them. This society, this culture, this civilization is characterized by endemic racism, just like every civilization before ours. It's also characterized by endemic misogyny, endemic monetary disparity leading to poverty. And then the United States elects a misogynist, racist, wealthy man, and people are surprised. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I've been doing stand-up tragedy for so long. <laughs> the kind of thing doesn't even slow me down anymore. Daniel Dennett was talking about religion when he said there's simply no polite way to tell people they've dedicated their lives to an illusion. So he's a, he's a well-known atheist, Daniel Dennett, and so he says things like this, and he's talking about religion, and so am I. There's no polite way to tell people they've dedicated their lives to an illusion. It's all an illusion. Climate change is just one outcome of a set of living arrangements characterized by lies. I call it civilization for a reason. It's all founded on a pack of lies. The science part of the show can be summarized in three slides, but I'll subject you to a little bit more torture than that. We could just point out that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, perhaps the most conservative scientific body in the history of the planet, 
concluded in their 2014 vaunted fifth assessment, heavily leaked beginning in September 2013, that global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering of the atmosphere's chemistry. In other words, we've gone over the cliff. This is the IPCC. It's irreversible. What that means, just to be clear, is that it can't be reversed. In the absence of massive geoengineering of the atmosphere's chemistry, what does that mean? To quote truth out, that means fantasy technology. There's no such way for that to work. The sciences, ever late to the party, even behind the journalists, in two major synthetic documents, one produced by the United States National Academy of Sciences, the other produced by a European body of similar stature, concluded that geoengineering is not a solution. So there you have it. Global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering of the atmosphere's chemistry, and geoengineering won't work. If you're thinking to yourself, this might turn out badly, I think you got it figured out. In fact, we now know that civilization is an omnicidal heat engine. It's civilization that's responsible for fouling that air and dirtying that water and washing the soil into the ocean. It's civilization that has monetized everything. It's civilization that's characterized by endemic racism and endemic misogyny. It's civilization that, that has convinced us of all these lies to such a great extent that they become assumptions undergirding how we live. We don't even talk about them. We just assume that everybody's going to go to school, and then they're going to go to school a little bit more, and then they're going to get married, and they're going to have 2.5 children, and they're going to work like slaves for 40 years, and then finally they're going to step back and go, what should I do with my life? Hmm. My parents did that. My dad started teaching the day he turned 20, and he counted every day from then on until retirement, and he retired, and then he didn't know what to do because he was just counting the days to retirement. So, of course, within a year, he was back at the same job doing the same thing, this time superintendent of a different school district than the one he left. And then he thought for the next couple of years about what it means to be him and what he actually enjoys in his life, what he might like to do for the rest of it. But he was on the treadmill to such a great extent, just like almost all of us are, that he didn't even really think about it. The faster he went, the more the bars became a blur. And then he stepped off the treadmill and he recognized that there were bars there and they had been there for the last 35 years. And now he's out. But what does it mean? Civilization is an omnicidal heat engine. According to the United Nations report from August 2010, we drive to extinction an estimated 150 to 200 species. 150 to 200 species driven to extinction every day. That's what civilization does. When I recognize civilization as an omnicidal heat engine killing everything in its past, every aspect of the, of the living planet, I did something that was deemed absolutely crazy. And who am I to argue? I left active service at the university. I was 49 years old. I was a full professor. I'm, I'm one of a handful of people in the last two decades that has been granted full professor status at any university before the age of 40 years old. I suspect I'm the only person at the University of Arizona to be awarded the, the top honors by the two transdisciplinary colleges in the entire university. So when I walked away from imperialism, when I left active service at the university and pulled my money out and decided we're going to live differently, I'm going to grow food for people, and I'm not going to participate in the omnicide that is civilization, I just knew that everybody would follow. <laughs> With the same sort of hubris I had when I was 18, <laughs> and I was telling people that they could live differently if they so choose, I expected, because I'm a privileged person, at a university, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a thing, right? I'm 49 years old, and you're going to follow me, just like my students did, out on the field trips. I used to be disgusted, and now I try to be amused. Within two years, I was able to grow an enormous amount of food. 
You have to bear in mind that when I started this project, I could barely distinguish between a screwdriver and a zucchini. I didn't know anything. I was a lifelong academic. I tried to fix my toilet in my house that I sold in suburban Tucson, Arizona. I tried to fix my toilet. It ended up costing me $500 in a new toilet. It was, a, it was like a 25 cent repair. And next thing you know, I'm building structures. I didn't build this straw bale house, but I built this outdoor kitchen. I built a partially subterranean straw bale greenhouse. I built all these things, and I built a goat shed to keep the goats out. And I learned how to take care of goats and chickens and ducks, turkeys, and a goose named Myrtle. Oh, the memories. And I learned how to grow food and make biochar. I designed a biochar kiln so that I could take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil for the next few thousand years because I'm fixing climate change, among other things. And then, within a couple of years, I realized that not a lot of people were going to follow. And then a couple of years after that, I realized that we had triggered an event called abrupt climate change. It was completely different than this linear Al Gore style climate change that most of us are familiar with. And that's what I was familiar with. It was 2007 when I did, made the decision to move here. We didn't know anything. Let me put that another way. I didn't know anything. 2007? Come on. Well, now we're in the midst of a phenomenon called abrupt climate change, which has historical precedence. It has occurred in planetary history, albeit not when humans were involved. And now we're spewing carbon and driving the rate of extinction at at least 10 times faster than ever before in planetary history. So let's look back over the course of the last 2 billion years. This is the timeline. This is the temperature. And you see that for the most part, there's two stable temperatures. There's ice age, 12 degrees Celsius, 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And then relatively abruptly, the planet comes out of an ice age and goes up to a hothouse condition, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, 22 degrees Celsius. It's only 10 degrees. It's only 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, most of us have experienced more than 18 degrees difference Fahrenheit today. You go outside, you come inside. Outside, it was below 54 this morning. It's probably warmer than 72 in here right now. So you're thinking, what could possibly go wrong? The issue is not how our bodies respond, our bodies per se, to the temperature. Rather, the issue is one of habitat. I'm a conservation biologist. Conservation biologists are involved with studying three basic tenets. The three basic underpinnings of conservation biology are speciation, how and where and when does a species come into being. Homo sapiens arose about 200,000 years ago. As a minor example, Homo sapiens, our, spe our favorite species, the wise ape. <clears throat> Two, extinction, when and what, why does a species go away? And we now know, as we've known for a long time, that most species go extinct because they run out of habitat. Almost no species goes extinct because we hunted them all. We almost certainly killed the last dodo. We certainly killed the last passenger pigeon. It died in the Cincinnati Zoo in the early 1900s. We certainly killed the last Carolina parakeet. It died in the Cincinnati Zoo in the early 1900s. If you ever find yourself in the Cincinnati Zoo and you seem lonely, you might want to get the hell out of there. <laughs> Apparently, it's a place where all the birds go to die. So we actually did hunt to extinction some organisms but almost all species on the planet that have ever gone extinct, which is 99% of the species on the planet so far, they go extinct. Almost all of them did so because they ran out of habitat. Many of them ran out of habitat because the global average temperature of the planet increased from 12 degrees Celsius to 22 or 23 degrees Celsius in a short period of time. That's what happened in each of the five previous mass extinction events and is happening in this, the sixth mass extinction event in planetary history. During the Great Dying, 252.2 million years ago, that's this one right here, the global average temperature of the planet came out of an ice age at 12 degrees Celsius, and in somewhere between one and three pulses, 
went up to 23 degrees Celsius. And that transition took somewhere between 880 and 18,800 years. So roughly 900 to roughly 19,000 years. We're going from here to a similar temperature. Actually, we're going from right there where civilization is, one and a half degrees above ice age, 13 and a half degrees Celsius, to here, plus or minus a tenth of a degree over the course of the next nine years or so. Almost all complex life on, on Earth died during the Great Dying. More than 90% of the species on the planet went extinct during this relatively abrupt rise in global average temperature because those species lost habitat, because the plants could not keep up with the rate of change. It's a delicate web. You're a native grass out there growing in a, in a prairie five miles from this town. You're growing in that spot because your seed landed there and because your particular species, you as an example of your species, have developed over evolutionary time for a very narrow range of environmental conditions. Very narrow. So that the rain comes at a certain time and the temperature increases and decreases at a certain time. And in this part of the world, because fire is swept through periodically, and also because there's a whole bunch of things going on below ground and above ground that we humans aren't even really paying attention to. If you're a grass that has been seeding, succeeding in these parts, or say in the Flint Hills of Kansas, has been exceeding in this, succeeding in this part of the world for thousands of years, it's because you have a relationship with a bunch of other organisms. You have relationships with pollinators. You have relationships with mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae that are below ground, with fungi that are below ground. You only get to, to drink water, to take water into your roots because you've established a relationship with the mycorrhizae. So people frequently tell me, when it gets hot, we'll just all move north. Okay, are we gonna take all of the mycorrhizae and all of the fungi and all the soils and all of the plants with us? Because if we don't, it's not going to do any good. And those plants can't get there as fast as the temperature is changing. If there's a mantra for realtors who happen to be conservation biologists, and I can't believe there hasn't been more intersection between those fields, <laughs> then the mantra is habitat, habitat, habitat. We require an unbelievably narrow range of environmental conditions. And if we don't have those conditions, we alter the environment accordingly. We build structures. We put on clothes. We make fire. That was probably the first mistake. We create language. Mistake number two. This is how we, how we mediate for an environment that we don't quite fit into. But you have to remember that we depend upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of other species too. And if you don't think you depend upon hundreds of other species, consider this, your body is comprised of hundreds of other species. And if just one of those species is having a bad day and it's in your stomach, you're not having a good day either. We've all had that experience. So if we don't take care of the delicate web that is taking care of us, we're screwed. And as it turns out, we haven't been taking care of the delicate web that is taking care of us. There are hundreds of species on and in your body that regulate how you respond to the environment and the food you eat and the water you drink. You notice this every time, say, for example, you travel to a foreign place. It doesn't even have to be out of the United States. It's a place where the water is treated just a little bit differently and the water is sourced just a little bit differently and you have this sort of stomach thing going on for two or three days after that. It's a delicate web. The organisms in your body are accustomed to here. They're not accustomed to Alaska. They're not accustomed to Hawaii. And they certainly aren't accustomed to Belize. <laughs> so humans arose, our favorite species, some 200,000 years ago. Civilization arose a few thousand years ago in light of this rise in temperature of one and a half degrees Celsius, and then a stability in that temperature. 
So the temperature has been stable for 11,000 years, more or less, since we entered the Holocene, since we came out of the last ice age. It's that stable, stable, cool temperature that allows us to grow grains at scale. Thus did arise several civilizations around the planet at about the same time. According to James Hansen, the, the, the godfather of climate change, in a legal brief filed about two years ago, humans have persisted on this planet only up to about two degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline. We're currently, that, that takes us to right here. Sorry, we are currently right here where the blue arrow is, and we've had humans up to right here. And I suspect we've had humans up to right here because that's where we find habitat for humans. We're human animals. We sometimes forget about that latter part. We are very clever. I, I think instead of calling ourselves Homo sapiens, the wise apes, we probably should have called ourselves Homo calidus, the clever ape. We are very clever. We have managed to overwhelm nature and bend nature to suit our demands. And yet, we've only had Homo sapiens on the planet right to there. And we're already at least right there. We've also had humans on the planet only for this thin slice in time. The universe is about 14 billion years old, 13.8, 14 billion years old. The planet is about 4.6 billion years old. And humans, humans, Homo sapiens have been here for 200,000 years. If the universe is all about us, damn, was that universe patient? <laughs> huh? I mean, the universe waited a long time. The universe is waiting 13.8 billion years. When are those humans going to show up? Things are going to get exciting when the humans show up. When is that going to, is, is that late already? That's amazing. We think it's all about us. Do we not? I mean, not just as individuals, never mind the filled with hubris examples I've given about myself so far. I'm sure you're all a finer person than I am, so you don't have those <laughs> issues. But consider, for example, this, the, the reign of the universe, 13.8 billion years of the universe. When did humans show up? That would be the last few cells on the end of my, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, that's it. I just scraped us off. It's like the universe might do. Seemingly uncaring about the universe's favorite invention, humans. So we haven't been here for very long. By title in The Gar Guardian, Oliver Tickell points out in August 2008 on a planet 4C hydrogen, he's talking about 4C above baseline, all we can prepare for is extinction. In this assessment, Tickell concludes that we are human animals and that we are going to persist up to about right there where the green arrow is. Actually, he then goes on, and I think in a terrible fit of hubris, concludes that we'll survive even beyond that point, maybe even six degrees Celsius. But really? Anyway, I'm not going to bicker about that. I think it's optimistic to think that we're going to make it to there. I think it's very optimistic to think that humans are going to be on the planet at five or six degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline. But we don't really know, do we? We haven't quite gone extinct yet. I don't know if you've noticed, but we added another 200 and some thousand people to the planet today. That's births minus deaths. So apparently we're not going away today. When do we go extinct? I don't know. When are you going to die? I get this question all the time. OK, first question in the audience. Yes, sir. What is your question? When am I going to die? I mean, nobody states it that way because it sounds a little silly. But that's really what they mean. They, they say something like, OK, I live in New York. And then like I'm supposed to read their mind, because I am. When, am I, what is, when are things going to get bad in New York? Or sometimes somebody will come right, right out and say, when does the shit hit the fan? And I say, are you kidding? The fan is covered with shit. The, sh the, the <laughs> shit has been hitting the fan for so long that the fan is covered with shit, and the shit is hitting the shit. And you just didn't notice. But if you lived in the Middle East or Northern Africa, if you lived in the South Pacific on one of those islands where there's no longer habitat for humans, you noticed. If you live in the Middle East or Northern Africa, I was touring Europe two years ago, and 
Europeans, we tend to think of them as being very accommodating, open-minded, liberal, love-fest kind of people, because after all, that's our roots, so they must be you know, a lot like us. I was touring Western Europe, and there was this enormous influx of people from the Middle East and Northern Africa. People were moving there, not because they didn't want to continue living in the home where, they, where their family had been for 17 generations. They did want to continue living there. They loved that place. But there was no longer habitat. They could no longer grow food. So they were fleeing to someplace better. And, and the Western European people couldn't stop talking about how horrible those people were. We're all running out of habitat. We're all going to be fleeing at some point. How we act in the face of those seemingly impossible odds defines our character. So maybe we'll persist to 5 or 6 or 12 or 22 degrees above, cell, above baseline. We don't know. We are very clever. You've got to hand it to us for that. The point of the paper in The Guardian is that we need habitat. When we're in the Dust Bowl that never ends, and this is one from the late 1950s in the southwestern United States, the food goes away. At some point, we become the livestock that run out of food. We depend upon a living planet for our own survival. We depend upon pollinators and filter feeders for food and water, respectively. We depend upon a complex flora in our own bodies so that we can process what we take in. We depend upon all these other things, but we act as if we don't. On July 15th, 2016, a person named Sam Carana put out an article, and I responded to it with an article of my own at hbass.gavincurse.com on the 1st of August, 2016, called The Politics and Science of Our Demise. Sam Carana is an anonymous person. He is two or maybe three people in Western Europe and the United States, and that's why Sam Carana can keep his, keep his day job. Because I promise anybody who writes or speaks about the kinds I write and speak about won't be supported in their job for very long. So Sam, the Sam Karanas know this, Sam or Samantha, and so they don't reveal who they are. They're obviously quite adept. They understand climate change in great detail. And they put together this information in a way that makes it easily understandable. I take on Sam Karana's analysis with an analysis of my own. And look, considering the 10-year lag between carbon dioxide emissions and maximum heating associated with those molecules, considering the rise above global average temperature so far since the beginning of civilization, the 1750 baseline, considering the removal of the aerosol masking effect or the, the so-called global dimming impact, and other self-reinforcing feedback loops, Karana comes up with 10.02 degrees Celsius above baseline, which would take us to the highest temperature ever recorded over the course of the last two billion years. That would take us to right up here. So I take a more conservative look and cobble together, add together all of the self-reinforcing feedback loops and the current rise in temperature. I take a more conservative approach than Karana does, and I come up with only at least 8.7 degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline by mid-2026, 10 years from now. As an indication of how conservative this assessment is, consider, for example, further feedbacks. I identify more than five dozen in this essay, further feedbacks. And Karana adds on only 0.3 degrees Celsius global average temperature rise from 1750 to 2026 as a result of these further feedbacks. One of them is from terrestrial permafrost degrading and giving off carbon dioxide and especially methane. So there's subsea methane, and there's also terrestrial permafrost that is leaking methane. So there's this paper in Siberian Times from 
July of 2016. There's the title of it right there, and it includes this little video clip. So I'm going to play this little video clip, and I want you to listen at about the 15-second mark, the second time the man po punches his heel into the ground in, into what looks like a trampoline or jello instead of permafrost, which by definition is permanently frozen and therefore hard. Second time he stabs his heel into the ground, you'll hear over the over the loud noise of the microphone, you'll hear a high-pitched hissing sound. That's pressurized methane and carbon dioxide spewing out of the earth. So listen carefully. It's not supposed to do that, by the way. I can't believe he's doing this, right? Like he might fall in and we never see him again. So he's pushing on the, on the thermomelt. And not this time, but the next time he sticks his heel in the ground, listen real close. You hear that? That's pressurized methane and carbon dioxide leaking directly out of the soil surface in what used to be permafrost. Yeah. Yikes. I've heard it put other ways, but it, yikes is good enough for this crowd. The bottom line is that my entire life we've thought we could live, give, keep living the same way and the kids would somehow adapt. And that is why Serena Raphael's friend was crying and attempting to commit suicide. Because hers is the generation, the millennials are the generation that are getting crapped on. And we expect them to fix it. Nobody adapts to a planet without habitat. That's why 150 to 200 species are being driven to extinction every day. They're running out of habitat. That's why there are so few great apes in the world. They're running out of habitat. There are more humans born every day than the sum total of all non-human great apes in the world. If that seems like it's a problem, I think you got this figured. Okay, again, I'd like to point out that the synthesis is that on a planet 4 sea hotter, or maybe 5 or 6, humans won't have habitat anymore. And that's, I think, optimistic, given that we've only had humans at this relatively narrow range in temperatures. Now, when I point out the 10-year time frame of Karana's analysis, almost everybody in the audience assumes, let's see, he wrote his paper July 15th, 2016, and he said in 10 years it's going to be this high temperature and humans probably won't adapt. So I think probably on July 14th, 2026 at midnight, I'm going to die. No, that's not what I mean. In fact, it could be a lot worse than this. I, I was interviewed by, by a mainstream media pundit, a guy named Paul Henry in New Zealand when I was touring there last November and December, and he kept mentioning 10 years. This is right after I'd done this analysis, and he kept saying 10 years, and I kept telling him no. No, you don't have 10 years. Our species doesn't have 10 years, and you don't have 10 years either. It's less. We don't know how long it is, but it's almost certainly less based on the fact that we add these things up, taking the most conservative route I could possibly take, and we get to 22 degrees. We get to hothouse in 10 years, nine years roughly from now. If I take a less conservative approach and, and assume that the incredibly conservative referee journal literature is actually not very conservative at all, I get us up to there, to the highest temperature ever achieved by Earth in the last two billion years, nine years from now. I'm not suggesting we have nine years. It could be a lot less. Karana went on to do an analysis, this is about two weeks ago, at the Arctic News blog, and, and he indicates we could have 10C warmer, 10C above baseline again by 2021. And what he's doing differently this time, instead of adding up all those pieces that I just mentioned, instead of adding up the albedo effect and the loss of global dimming and the 10-year lag in carbon dioxide emissions to maximum heating, so instead of adding those up in linear fashion, let's take instead an exponential function and fit it to the existing data. Instead of taking a linear approach, let's look at what has happened in the past with abrupt climate change events and appears to be happening this time. And then he says it's four years, and I'm not suggesting that you have three years and 364 days and that you'll die in your sleep on that night. 
whatever night that is. What I'm suggesting is that it will seem rather short. And here's the best case I can come up with for that. The war world's oldest human being at the time, in early March of 2015, turned 117 years old. And at her 117th birthday party, she was asked by a journalist to ponder those first 117 years of her life. And she said, and I quote, it's only four words, hang with me on this one, it seemed rather short. <laughs> she was 117, she's at her birthday party. What's that like to live 117 years? It seemed rather short. And then, to put a punctuation mark on her message and mine, she died a few weeks later. It seemed rather short. I don't know how much time we have. She thought it had seemed rather short. I guarantee nobody in this room is going to live to 117. And if you do, I won't be here to, to track me down, to prove me wrong. It could be much faster than this, even. Natalia Shakova and colleagues, three of her colleagues, at the European Geophysical Union meeting in late 2008 wrote an abstract, and then she presented the paper, Natalia Shakova did, pointing out that release of up to 50 gigatons of methane hydrate from the relatively shallow sea floor of the Arctic Ocean is highly possible for abrupt release at any time. This is almost 10 years ago. Two years ago, she came out of an, interv an interview and said, we never stated that such a release would occur in near or distant future. We never stated. You can go online. Most of you have a digital device in your pocket right now that will allow you to go online, look up the European Geophysical Union meeting abstracts from 2008, find the paper by Natalia Shakova and other colleagues pointing out this direct quote. She then lied later and said, we never stated this would occur. Isn't that interesting? She had been heavily censored by her university at that point. If that occurs, and it's highly possible for abrupt release at any time, if that occurs this summer, for example, when it appears we're going to experience the first ice-free Arctic in human history, an event forecasted by the U.S. Naval Postgraduate College in 2013 as will occur in 2016 plus or minus three years. So they predicted it to occur in 2016 plus or minus three years. I'd say we dodged a bullet four years in a row, but that we aren't going to dodge it forever. Is this the year of the ice-free Arctic? It certainly looks like we're headed that direction, but maybe not. Maybe it'll hold off for another year or two. If that happens, how do we avoid this, this big burst of methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean? I can't imagine we do. And when that happens, we're well above the temperature at which human beings have persisted at any time in the past. That's enough to take out the ability to grow grains and therefore the ability to maintain civilization because this civilization, like all others, depends upon the ability to grow and distribute grains at scale. Without that, civilization fails. And now we're at about 6 degrees Celsius by maybe the middle of next year because the crops all fail. Habitat, habitat, habitat. It's not as if we weren't warned. The director of the United Nations Environment Program for New York was quoted by the Associated Press, and as a consequence, this appeared in every significant newspaper in the United States on the 29th of June, 1989, and he said governments have a 10-year window of opportunity to solve the greenhouse effect before it, quote, goes beyond human control. If I'm doing the math right, that was 39, 38, 30, but do I hear 28? <laughs> do I hear 28 years ago that he was quoted in saying this? So apparently we had until... 1999 to fix this. And we didn't fix it, did we? In fact, I think every year, certainly almost every year since 1989, and certainly every decade since then, we've set a new record for carbon emissions. The exception is the last two years. In the last two years, anthropogenic carbon emissions are down because we're in the midst of of the Great Depression, version 
And so humans are not burning nearly as much carbon as they used to. However, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased to record levels in each of those two years. In fact, each of the last four years, it's set a new record. It appears the situation has spun out of human control because our emissions have been reduced, and yet carbon dioxide and methane are still going exponential in the atmosphere. Not long after this, a year and a couple of months later, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases points out that one degree C is the absolute upper limit. That's the target. That's a scientific target, not the two degrees C established by a wacko economist that everybody believed, even though he's an economist. The United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases points out that beyond one degree C may elicit rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses. I call them self-reinforcing feedback loops. Other people call them positive feedbacks. There's a system spinning out of human control. And this is where the United Nations group of scientists gets it exactly right with their focus on, I'm going to say it again, habitat, 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 could lead to extensive ecosystem damage, such as haboobs, which that's a word we never even used in the Northern Hemisphere until five years ago, and now we get one every year. We never use terms like thunderstorm asthma, rain bombs. Those terms didn't exist five years ago. Now we have this whole new terminology for abrupt climate change and the consequences of abrupt climate change. That's October of 1990. Within a few years, the United Nations capitulated to an economist and decided that two degrees C was a target. And that's what they continue to promulgate at these meetings. But one degree C was the target. And according to science writer and speaker David Spratt, half a degree was probably closer to the truth. That's when things started spinning out of control. That's when the self-reinforcing feedback loops kicked in. And this was a long time ago. This is way before Al Gore showed up. This is before James Hansen showed up in 1988 on the floor of Congress and pointed out that Houston, we have a problem. So one of my messages here is that we didn't know. There's no blame. There's no shame. There's there's no guilt. We don't need to capitulate to any of that because we were born into captivity just like everybody else. We were born at a certain time in a certain place and we didn't get to vote on that. We showed up into this set of living arrangements and we lived like other people, like the culture was telling us to live. Most of us without questioning the culture and what do you expect? That's where culture comes from. So we had our warnings, and our response looks a lot like this. This is me. This is what we do. We call this progress, in fact. We got smartphones. It's all going to be fine. I speak about abrupt climate change. Somebody says, is there an app for that? <laughs> we got an app for everything, right? That's not bad enough. As the referee journal literature finally figured out a couple of years ago, we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Entering the sixth mass extinction, I think that's a little conservative. Scientists have been writing books, albeit not published in the referee journal literature, because that's too conservative. They've been writing books for 20 years that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. The United Nations advisory group, sorry, the United Nations report that came out in August of 2010 pointed out that we were driving to extinction 150 to 200 species a day. That doesn't count. We're now entering the sixth mass extinction in 2015. A little late to the party, I think. Love, love the scientific jargon for the title. Accelerated modern human-induced species losses. The hell is that? I, I guess... If you put it in the title of a referee journal article, we're killing everything, that's not going to sell. In an interview coincident with the release of this paper, the senior author, Gerardo Ceballos, says life would take many millions of years to recover. Of course it would, because that, that's what happens in the wake of every mass extinction event so far. It takes many millions of years to recover, and our species itself, our favorite species, would likely disappear early on. He was wrong about that because at this point we're already five years after we're driving 150 to 200 species to extinction every day and we're not among them. Good point. 
But we will be. Our species was not among the first to disappear. Thousands of others were. But we don't have long. In the end, it will seem rather short. I have good news for you. I do have a version with a happy ending. I'm like Hollywood. I wouldn't leave you to, my, to stew in your own juices, as was, was spoken about me lately in the S-Town podcast put out by National Public Radio. National Public Radio puts together this six and a half hour podcast, and the key figure in the, in the whole story was a guy named John B. McLemore, and it was called the S-Town podcast, short for shit town, because John B. McLemore referred to his small town in Alabama as little shit town Alabama. John would call me on the phone every week or so and talk to me about the, the dire straits we're in. And he had read a couple of my books. And the, the podcast was actually very fair and reasonable. And then Richard Heinberg of the Post Carbon Institute writes about the podcast. He said something like Surviving S-Town Podcast. That's a title. And, and he concludes that I caused the suicide of John B. McLemore just as dozens of conventional main and even mainstream media people, to the extent mainstream people will take on this topic, conclude that I drove my friend Michael C. Rupert to suicide in April of 2014. So apparently, me talking about this causes people to commit suicide. And that's why now I have the happy ending. You wondered where I was going with that. The happy ending is we get to die. Oh, wait. Maybe I said that a little abruptly. Yeah, it's interesting. I hear this, this millennial phrase, YOLO, all the time. Anybody ever heard that, YOLO? What's it mean? Yeah, that's wrong. That's wrong. It's YODO. You only die once. You live every day. If you want. If you choose. You get to live and live fully every single day. Yo, do. You only die once. Someday we will all die. But you knew that. I knew that finally when I turned 11. Before that point, I knew that everybody died, but I wasn't sure it was going to affect me. And then I turned 11 and my grandmother died, and it occurred to me, hey, this, this almost certainly means I'm going to die too. So you've known this for a while. I'm just here to remind you and to remind you that it will seem rather short and to ask you what you'll do in the, inter in the intervening time. How will you live in light of your terminal diagnosis given to you at birth? I suggest various actions. I suggest that you remain calm, or if you're not calm, that you get that way, <laughs> because nothing is under control. It's certainly not under your control. It's certainly not under my control. I mean, the people pulling the strings of empire don't include the people in this room, unless, Mark Austin, you're out there. We're not in control. I don't think they're in control either. I think we think that they're in control, but they're really not. They're just juggling chickens and chainsaws trying to hold the system together for another day. <laughs> they don't know what's going on. Abrupt climate change is going to affect them too. In fact, one of my favorite things... One of my favorite things about near-term human extinction resulting from abrupt climate change, and there aren't very many of my favorite things about that, but perhaps my favorite thing about near-term human extinction is that the jerks die too. <laughs> Remain calm. Nothing is under control. When somebody cuts you off in traffic, it could be worse. <laughs> Second, and there will be no reward for this, no external reward, no monetary reward, no power will come your way as a result of pursuing excellence in a culture of mediocrity. You're right. There's no reward for any damn thing. You're a bummer, aren't you? Who let her in? Who let her in? Security? Security, can we get her out of here? Stealing my lines here. 
In a culture of mediocrity, there is no external reward for pursuing excellence, for doing the right thing. But at the end of the day, you get to do something that not a lot of people get to do. You get to look yourself in the mirror without embarrassment. That's all you've ever had. That's all we've ever had, is the ability to look at ourselves and not judge harshly. Similarly, pursuing love, especially if your love is of living instead of making a living, will not get you a lot. Except again, that feeling when you're taking your last breath that it wasn't all for naught. That you did get to let yourself in the mirror. That you did serve as a model for your children and your grandchildren and the other people around you. What more could you want? Other actions I encourage are to act more like your dog than you, especially if your dog is house trained. When you take your dog on a walk, I'm pretty sure you could even get away with this in this town, no leash needed. Your dog sees four trees and a sun when you take him out to the park and there's four trees and a sun. You don't. I don't. I see all kinds of things, and the trees and the sun are not among them. So I see the podium I'm standing behind. I see the choir I'm preaching to. I see the woman in my life who's not very happy. I see my busted laptop and the keyboard gone awry. I'm driving my car. I'm, having it. I'm hearing the music in my head. So that's mostly what we do, is we live in the past, and we live in the future, and we don't live in the now. And that's why your dog is happier than you are. Take a lesson. We were all born into captivity, but we don't have to reinforce the bars. We can throw off some of the shackles of culture. We cannot be the person who goes to school and then goes to school some more and has 2.5 children and works as a slave, as my friend Forrest Palmer calls it, the slave. That's what he calls his job. He's a black man, an African-American, living in Houston, so he can get away with using the word slave, whereas most of us can't, without negative connotation coming our way. So we don't have to do the same thing everybody else does every single day. I'm not suggesting that everybody quit their job. That didn't work out all that well for me, trust me. But maybe if you aren't enjoying your job, maybe if your job is more like a treadmill than a joyful experience, Maybe you could cut back a little bit. Maybe you couldn't take it so damn seriously. Maybe you could spend time with the people you love doing the things you love instead of serving the corporate masters who run the whole show anyway. Maybe you don't have to use the expectations of others to reinforce your own cage. Oh, there's more. If you want to delve into the science of what I'm talking about and try to disprove anything I've just said, and I would way more than welcome that, trust me. You can go to a single essay at Nature Bass Last. You can, if you want to go beyond that, beyond the science, and think about how to live in light of your terminal diagnosis, I co-authored a book with Carolyn Baker called Extinction Dialogues. Probably you cannot see the subtitle from back there. It says, How to Live with Death in Mind. How do you live with death over your, over your left shoulder? You live with urgency. You live as if the days matter. You live as if the people matter, the people in your life. You live as if the planet matters, the planet within your circle. So this book, co-written by my colleague and counselor and history teacher, goes beyond the science and describes what we might do about that. And then if you're interested in this set of living arrangements, industrial civilization or the industrial economy or whatever you want to call it, the story we tell ourselves about ourselves, this book is intended for ages 11 and up and was written by my partner and I from the perspective of insects, Ms. Ladybug and Mr. Honeybee, a love story at the end of time. And in language inspired by Charlotte's Web and other great children's books, it describes what we're doing to our only home and how we might live in light of our terminal diagnosis. 
And there's a few copies of that book on the shelf back there. And finally, Pauline and I have developed a workshop called Only Love Remains. It's for people who have concluded that, sure enough, there might be something to this abrupt climate change, and in fact, my life might be rather short. And you're having a difficult time coming to grips with that conclusion. And if that's you, we have put together this workshop for you so that we can form a community. And that's something I would encourage for the people here is to create an opportunity for yourselves, not even including this workshop. Maybe somebody passes around a sign-up sheet and somebody takes responsibility for curating that sign-up sheet by sending the first email message that says we're going to meet at XYZ the third Thursday of every month. If you want to be there to have the conversation nobody else is willing to have, let's just be there and have a drink or share a meal or have a conversation. There are ways forward in light of our terminal demise, in light of our terminal diagnosis. There are ways forward that involve joy, that involve happiness, that involve embracing reality for what it is and still living as if the moments matter, still living as if the people in your life matter. And that's what this is all about. And blah, 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 that's enough of that. I would be happy, happy if somebody could launch a question or two my way. Yes, sir. Early and can we turn on the lights? Yes. Yes, you have a question. Early in the presentation, you mentioned all 440 nuclear power plants melting down. Right. What would cause that? That would cause, the, the demise of civilization would cause that. Because the demise of civilization means that the petrodollar no longer has value. And who's going to go to the nuclear power plants to maintain them when there's no monetary reward for doing so? David, in a, in a documentary film created by Pauline Schneider called Going Dark and released in 2015, she interviewed David Jasko the most recent ex-head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission of the United States, and asked him, here we are at Indian Point Nuclear Power Facility, right outside of New York City. If we start decommissioning it right now, how long would that take to decommission it? 17.78 And he said, the most recent ex-head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says, 60, and then he realized that number was too big, so he says 60 or 50 years if we start right now and we have the money. Yeah, but the share is 60 or 50 years to decommission one nuclear power plant that we're not working on decommissioning, that ex that's, whose license expired years ago and continues to operate without a license. And there's 400 more, just like that one, that we're not beginning to decommission either that will take at least 17.78 years to decommission if we start right now and throw a lot of money at it. And we aren't. <coughs> well, what happens? If people don't go to work, and even first responders don't go to work beyond a, a couple of days because they go home to be with their family members. In the case of a real emergency, people are only going to try to stick the fingers in the dike for a limited amount of time. They'll stop going to the nuclear power plant. We don't have 50 or 60 years without sea level rise overwhelming a whole bunch of those nuclear power plants because almost all of them are built on the coast where it's relatively cool. And the demise of the petrodollar and on and on and on the list goes. The inability to grow grains at scale defines every civilization so far, including this one. If we don't have grains grown at scale, we don't have civilization, which means we don't have the petrodollar which means people are not paid to go to work to decommission nuclear power plants, much less keep them running safely. So is it the methane release that would cause something catastrophic like that where you worry about food for a few days and then... That, that could be. It could be the methane, or it could be the combination of methane release from the Arctic Ocean and any number of the other 60-some self-reinforcing feedback loops that combine. There was a paper in... Truth out in April of 2015, I think, 
But if you go to Truth Out and just put in the search box, agriculture on the brink. What it really said was civil, what, it, what the article really described is civilization on the bank, on the brink. Because the title was agriculture on the brink, but agriculture for the purposes of this article meant growing grains at scale. And the article pointed out that we're already on the edge. We're already at the very upper limit of the point at which we're able to grow grains at scale in the United States and Russia and, the, and Asia and the very few places where we're growing enough grains to support all these people. So it could be that we reach that tipping point faster than expected. Here's an example. Last weekend in western Kansas, there was a snow and hail storm that came way too late after a winter that was way too mild. The too mild winter meant that the wheat grew too tall and the early cold storm destroyed a huge fraction of this year's winter wheat crop. It's done. Do you know how much wheat the United States has in storage? You know, there's always a bunch of storage. The financial crisis, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, the United States sold all its grain supplies, all the storage. We got nothing. We're the civilization that's no longer a civilization. We don't have any food stored. We got like canned peaches in our cupboards. You're on your own, folks. So civilization agriculture truly teeters on the brink because of the direct interconnection between civilization and the ability to grow grains at scale. And then you tack on those self-reinforcing feedback loops and it all goes. Sorry to give the impression. I'm not trying to give a course in Buddhism here. No, no, I was just <laughs> picking a couple of minor examples and trying to weave it into the story. Okay. My, right. My apologies for apparently misrepresenting your perspective. I've been heavily influenced by the philosophy, if not the religion, of Buddhism. The part you just talked about, the religion part. I've been heavily influenced by the philosophy part, as were Nietzsche and Hope Schopenhauer. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I'm, I'm sorry if you kind of addressed this in other parts of your work. I think I might not be as familiar as some people here. Um, but I was just wondering what you think about, like, so Naomi Klein, a couple of years ago, released a book called This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate, in which she argues that there is this, a possibility for broad social movements, not like the ruling class and not people on the top, but broad social movements to kind of coalesce together to enact like systemic change that could mitigate the worst effects of climate change and also kind of, you know, make, make human settlements more resilient and, uh, and, and stop putting more, stop burning more fossil fuels. And I was wondering if you have, so from this speech, I didn't get a lot of sense that that's something that you, I, I, I don't know, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Tim, Tim Garrett wrote his first paper. Tim Garrett is an associate professor at the time he wrote the paper, I think he's a full professor now at the University of Utah. 
and he is an atmospheric scientist who focuses on the thermodynamics of climate change at a large scale. And he concluded in a paper written in 2007, published in November 2009, pulled from publication immediately thereafter because there was a huge outcry from the scientific community because scientists didn't like the answer. It was subsequently published in February 2011 for real, and you can find it under the February 2011 in the February 2011 edition of Climatic Change, one of the more prestigious journals in the world. And he points out, civilization, he points out that civilization is a heat engine. Civilization is a heat engine. This was published in November 2009, but immediately pulled from publication because scientists rebelled and said, you can't attack civilization. Naomi Klein is the best anti-capitalist capitalist in the world. She claims to be against capitalism, and she benefits greatly from capitalism. The making of the documentary film, This Changes Nothing, or Everything, was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. You think they're going to willingly allow civilization to go away? Of course not. Do you think she's a fan of that? So she points at capitalism as if any ism is the problem. What does she suggest we replace capitalism with? More capitalism. She doesn't call it that, though. Civilization itself is a heat engine. It doesn't matter if we power it with wind turbines and solar panels. It still is a heat engine. That's the, the gist of Tim Garrett's now extensive body of work. That's the bad news. Civilization is a heat engine. And it's, it's why we're here. It's what keeps us alive. I rely just as much as you do on electricity and water coming out of the taps. I rely just as much as you do on food at the grocery store. Civilization is a heat engine that drives to extinction 150 to 200 species every day and fouls the air and dirties the water and washes the soil into the ocean and all that. It's horrible. And it's a heat engine. That's the bad news. The, the worst news, yes, it's hard to believe, there's a worse news. The worst news is when civilization goes away, according to... Referee journal article report from 2013, no doubt very conservative. When the civilization goes away, when the omnicidal heat engine breaks down, the planet heats up really, really fast, like about three degrees Celsius in a week or two. Now we're at 4.6 degrees Celsius above baseline. Within a matter of weeks, maybe months, after civilization breaks down. Because at the same time civilization is producing greenhouse gases that hold the heat close to the earth, the blankets that we put on every winter are held there in the summer as well. In addition to producing greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and chlorofluorocarbons and water vapor and nitrous oxides and on and on and methane, in addition, by burning fossil fuels, especially by burning coal and particularly by burning low quality coal, we put sulfates into the atmosphere. These sulfates, or aerosols, serve as an umbrella. So at the same time we're, we're putting blankets over us, we're also putting an umbrella over us. And if we stop putting the particulates up into the atmosphere, they all fall out every day. We put more up every day. If we stop putting them up, they all fall out. They all fall down. And the global average temperature heats up about 3 degrees Celsius in a matter of days. September 14th, 2001, a researcher went out and asked the question, I wonder about those planes that stopped flying in the United States. We're still all burning coal. All those other planes were flying everywhere else in the world three days after 9-11. I wonder if that affects the global average temperature signature. Three days later, it did. Because of a reduction in commercial air flights in the United States. That's how sensitive the planetary temperature is to relatively small changes in our collective behavior. So we either keep the omnicidal heat engine known as civilization going, which is awful, or we turn it off, which means we die soon. So the one way we die really fast, and the other way we die really fast. That's a great question. It reminds me of a quote by Mike Tyson. You probably all know the, the, the boxer, Mike Tyson, who's now a philosopher. Did you know that? 
He has a one-man show. And this is my favorite line of his. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> so we've been, plan we've been punching the plan in the face for some 300 years. We've been punching plan in the face, we, and, and we expect something other than where we're at. I don't have a plan. I'm, I'm living fully. I, I, I've given people nine actions they can take that I think are quite reasonable to pursue excellence, to pursue love, to remain calm, and all those other things you're shaking your head about. You can read about the... For some, apparently, that's a pursuit of excellence in and of itself. Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon are not interested in pursuing the kind of excellence that we're talking about here. Some might call that pursuing hedonism. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Party like it's 1999. No, the, uh, these two bodies I mentioned, the uh, United States National Academy of Sciences and a European body of similar stature concluded that geoengineering is not a viable solution because they looked at the referee journal literature and concluded that the most common form of geoengineering is what's called solar radiation management, that's putting particulates into the sky artificially as opposed through what we normally do by burning coal. And, and so they looked at the record, they looked at things like Pinatubo, the volcano that went off in 1987, and they discovered that there's a slight decrease in global average temperature, or at least a slight slowing of the increase in temperature over time with a volcano eruption. But then when the par particles fall out of the atmosphere, the heating proceeds even faster than it was going before. So these two reports synthesize this enormous collection of evidence and conclude that actually geoengineering isn't going to fix, isn't going to repair climate change. In fact, it's probably going to make things worse. But they were only looking at one form of it. No, 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 no. I, I gave that as an example of the most common pro proposed, the most commonly proposed means of geoengineering is solar radiation management. But they all also looked at throwing iron filings into the ocean. They looked at all known proposed solutions that fall into the category of geoengineering. So you're talking about known today, but technology has a way of taking these profounds, whether it's by alienation or tipping or whatever way. So if the technology can even take these profounds, the, the good news possibly could be Sure. Of course. I don't know when you're going to die. I don't know when we're going to go extinct. We might come up with the requisite 3,000 miracles to keep this game going while not further damaging the planet. It could happen. I, I just came from San Francisco, California, from Berkeley, actually, interacted with an individual who came across my work in December. And he's... He's, very, he's in a position of enormous privilege, and he has access to a lot of money. And he just refuses to believe that there is no answer. So we had a, we had a little panel discussion. We had two presentations. And, we, and I talked to him, and I like him a lot. And I'm going to go see him Monday. I'm going to go spend a week with him in Seattle, where he lives, where he used to be a, a manager of strategic corporate operations for Microsoft. And I'm going to have the conversation with him that very few people are willing to have because I'm looking for an answer, too. I don't want humans to go extinct. I get that thrown at me all the time because I present this evidence, which seems so compelling to me, that we're headed for our own demise in the very near term. That doesn't mean I want it to happen. There's a long list of people I want dead, but I'm not on it. <laughs> And you're not on it, because we just only met. <laughs> so 
So I, I'm a huge fan of things that we might come up with. But I also think that it will seem rather short. And she's talking about an article I wrote for the Weekly Hubris, which is a monthly oh, yes. e-zine. Yes, um, I, I just read it, and I just felt very compelled that you were putting out the call to um, accelerate industrial collapse. Mm -hmm. Is that something you advocate, or is how can I help with that? Is that what I'm asking? Yeah. Besides voting with my money and how I use Right, it. right. So... It's pretty clear that civilization is an omnicidal heat engine. If you haven't reached that conclusion yet, you really haven't been paying attention. And so there are horrible things associated with this story we tell ourselves about ourselves. We're killing all those other species. We're fouling the air and dirtying the water and destroying the soil, and this, this set of living arrangements is characterized by endemic racism and endemic misogyny, and just because we're, we're nice people here, doesn't mean that we aren't supporting a system that is absolutely horrible and horrific. So how do we change that? Well, the Naomi Klein anti-approach or approach, which I still don't really understand, doesn't change it. It tweaks at capitalism, but doesn't get at the root, which is too many people consuming too much stuff on too small of a planet. How do we get there? How do we dismantle this set of living arrangements while simultaneously shutting down the nuclear power plants around the world? There are a couple of guidebooks. There's an online book free, written by my friend Keith Varnish, called... Isn't there the limit to that as well? Because you have all this stored nuclear waste that's just burning from Manhattan Project time. Manhattan. Listen, it's Hollywood. Can you not steal my thunder here? You people are so depressing. I don't know how I put up with you on these tours every day. I, I, I hate it when I'm the most optimistic person in the room. Underminers. Underminers. You can find the book Underminers at underminers.org. Thank you. That's by Keith Farnish. There's also Derek Jensen's book, end game. The second volume particularly is focused on things that we can do to dismantle the set of living arrangements. And the first volume points out why it's, pro why it's problematic. It goes into much more detail than I have here in only 500 pages about why civilization is, a heat, is an omnicidal heat engine. So there are things we can do. I don't talk about them much now because I don't think there's going to be a mass upwelling of people willing to, to do that. I don't think, I think that's one of the things that's not under our control. And so even if I am a fan, I'm not going to be too attached to that outcome whenever it occurs. And in addition, we now know that it, it sort of doesn't matter because the whole house of cards is coming down in the not too distant future, no matter what we do as individuals. So it's all about how we live now and living fully now and praying for the miracle. I'm going to stop right there. I'll, I'll be here as long as you find folks would like and talk with you individually one-on-one, -on -one, but we have food coming out, and I would hate to get in the way of that.